All right, we're back for another show. This one's going to be extremely fun. <laughs> uh, it's always good when you have an old pal, uh, somebody that you used to compete against all the time, somebody that oh. you work together. So today we've got Lamonte Coleman. How you doing, Lamonte? Andrew, it's uh, great to be on the show, man. Thanks for having me. I'm glad you could uh, make it. I know we've been talking about it for probably a month or two. So I was like, you know what? I got to pin him down <laughs> and get him on it. Cause we, we had some good battles over the years, but kind of just give us your background. So everybody has a, a better understanding of who Lamonte is. Absolutely. Um, so um, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, home of the Pittsburgh Steelers and um, proud, um, proud to be uh, the son of uh, Georgia and Norris Coleman. Uh, went to Slip Rock University for my, uh, my undergraduate studies and then uh, was able to sign a, um, a free agent two-year deal with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, didn't finish at Slip Rock. Um, ended up going to Ohio State and Ohio University for my bachelor's and master's in business degrees. Um, <clears throat> and then I ended up wanting, I had this entrepreneurial idea of actually being an owner. And of course, with me loving football, baseball, basketball, uh, I was blessed enough to uh, scrape some money out the couch with my wife. Uh, she thought it was a crazy idea, but she backed me and started an uh, indoor professional football team uh, outside of Columbus, Ohio, called the Marion Blue Racers. I was the president CEO in every hat you can think of for about five years and um, uh, ended up moving to different different leagues. And that's where you and I connected, you know, with you being the uh, president CEO of uh, the UIFL, which was the best year, man. It was competitive. You and I went at it. Your teams were dominant. You won championships. I was like the little brother, you know, trying to get on board. And um, yeah, so right now um, we decided to shut the business down after five years. Uh, we have two small kids, Kenny and Christopher, who we love tremendously. And we didn't want them to grow up in a cold climate. Uh, like Pittsburgh and Columbus, so yuck. Nobody likes that. <laughs> I know. So coming down to some of our league meetings, I remember one year, I think in 2012, and saw how you was um, really doing well. <laughs> <laughs> you motivated me and my wife. She, it was so such a motivation that she didn't even come to the league meetings as an owner. She stayed on the beach, man. So it's like you tell uh, Andrew and Leah hello. I'm gonna just stay here with the kids, whatever. So, but um, down here in South Florida. Uh, so I, I migrated down here in 2016, jumped on board with the Miami Dolphins part-time, and then ended up being a guest experience administrator, so from 2016 to 2019, and then um, another opportunity opened up with the with the Miami Marlins through West Security under Garter World, which uh, Garter World is the umbrella company, uh, the number one security company in the world. So at, in that position, um, I'm the event manager, so basically I handle all contract security and guest experience for the Miami Marlins, which as you already know that we are postponed a little bit due to COVID-19. So that's kind of pretty much of a, uh, of a quick version of uh, my background. Well, I mean, when you, you played though, I mean, at um, Slippery Rock, I mean, you, you put up some, some numbers too. I mean, you know, so, I mean, don't, you know, downplay your playing experience. Would you, would you do at Slippery Rock? Cause I mean, you're like one of the, all-time leaders, aren't you? Uh, absolutely, man. I tell you, Slippery Rock, uh, Slippery Rock is like the cornerstone. You know, you go to college and, you know, you have some parties and things like that, but it was really led, not to be corny, but Dr. George Mahalik, uh, he's a head, he's a, the head football coach. He also started the safety program up at Slippery Rock, which is like the number one program up there. But that was the cornerstone of uh, knowing how to be a man, uh, direction in life. I mean, goodness gracious, he prepared me for my first first real job out of college with by signing a six-figure deal with the, with the Pittsburgh Steelers. So, yes, uh, in two years, basically, I was there for three years, started for two, uh, broke, broke a lot of records, rushing, scoring, uh, points, uh, yards in the game my junior year, and basically uh, outdid them my, my senior year, uh, which ended up um, being going to a pro game, um, a ball game, but one of my my offensive line was just phenomenal, man. Brian Woodring, Pete Geis, uh, Matt, Matt Moritz, John Oldham. Those guys took care of me. Like, we played against Youngstown State, uh, Jimmy Trussell, uh, 94, the year they won the championship. And 
here we are, a Division II team, and they don't they don't allow anybody to score. My old line, they had an attitude. They're the big uglies. They're like, let's go. You know, who's this Jimmy Trussell? I said, I'll tell you who it is, but after the game. So, but uh, two touchdowns the first quarter. You know, I'm putting my my hand up to the ear like Youngstown, who you know. Later on, it was 52-17 Youngstown State. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't you didn't put that hand up to the ear much after that, then? No, no, not at all, not at all. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, Slippery Rock, man, you know. I still own a lot of records after 24, 25 years. And um, I have to say that without Slippery Rock, you know, I may, have, may not have had that opportunity as a Proposition 48 kid coming out of high school. Yeah. And you were running back or fullback? Running back. We actually, uh, in 92, our coaches decided to get out of the whole uh, three yards in a cloud of dust. So we went down to, they went down to UM and basically mimicked and copied the, the uh, three, uh, three wide system with one back. So I was the eye back, no fullback, and read, you know, basically read off the center off of a zone read scheme. And um, between myself and Greg Hopkins, who's like on the top 25 list, all arena ball players, you know, he was kind of like my, we were Batman and Robin. You know, you want you you put eight in the box, you can't stop Hoppy. You know, you you go to a base D, and then basically I cut you up with my line. So it was a great deal. So what did you do? You know, you you had a brief stint with the Steelers. What uh, you played a little arena as well for a couple of years, or how long were you in that? Yeah. So after <clears throat> you know, uh, first year off and on with the Steelers on a practice squad, end up going to the Super Bowl, losing to the Dallas Cowboys in a ridiculous. T- <laughs> Uh, we might have to end this, man. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I respect I respect Jerry Jones. He's a great owner, horrible GM. But, you know, when you go up against Irvin, Sanders, Aikman, you know what I'm saying, you know, I mean, those guys, they were top heavy. After 96, I got released and uh, ended up going to Milwaukee Mustangs. Um, Milwaukee Mustangs, they um, – it was, it was a new concept. I really didn't hear about arena football, but I was out there – um, actually, Lincoln Coleman, former Dallas Cowboy, he was the fullback starter. And uh, I just didn't get the hang of it. So after camp, I got out of there and basically just said, just hung it up, played some flag football, and uh, ended up going to uh, Wilkes-Barre Scranton, uh, Pioneers of Arena 2. I see the football up there. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Wilkes-Barre Scranton, man. They, uh, they were owned and operated by um, the late and great uh, Johnny Unitas, yeah. Um, he actually passed the inaugural season. And then um, me and Terry Karg, uh, he was the head coach. I ended up going with him because uh, when the Steelers allocated me in 96, uh, I was picked up by the Scotland Claymores of the World League of American Football. And we ended up winning it that year uh, in 96 when they went in the World Bowl. Um, I got hurt that year and they sent me back home to Free Rivers. But uh, after that, Rochester, Rochester Brigade, I was – Starting fullback linebacker there in uh, uh, 03, 03, 04. And then I ended up playing, uh, actually in 2001, I was the MVP uh, offensive player of the year for the Johnstown J Dogs of the National Good old Johnstown, man. Football League. Remember Ooh. the Niffle? You were in the Niffle, right? Well, yeah. Yeah, I was uh, in 04. 04. And then 04. 05 is when I started the AIFL. Okay. Uh, we started a team in Johnstown in 05. Oh, so you owned the Jackals? No, the uh, what the hell was the team called? The Riverhawks. Riverhawks, River yes. Because that was that was the team I bought in the NIFL. Was the Greenville Riverhawks? They mm. had financial issues, so I came in, saved the team, finished out the season, and then I just said, okay, well, we have this the Riverhawks. Let's uh, just make it Johnstown, and so we put it in there. And I ended up selling the team to a guy named Brian Schwelling. And yeah, we had the team in there for a couple of years. So. That's the crazy story. I still have my contract for the Johnstown Riverhawks. Really? I still have it. And I'm going to tell you, because I was the MVP in 01, played in a couple other places. Remember Brian Brazil? Yeah, because I hired him as a coach there. Um, I... Because initially I was the owner until I found an owner. Okay. So I sold it. So. Uh, yeah, so Brian, who he was like a high school coach too, and then I think he went on and coached a little college ball at uh, somewhere there in like the Maryland PA border. Mm-hmm. What the hell is that school called? Um, 
He was doing both. I yeah. mean, and the reason why I knew I can uh, I can corroborate that story is because in 12, when I was in your league, that's the year that um, I got a call from Chris Siegfried to come coach D-line for the power. So Brazil, I was coaching the D-line, and Brazil, right. was, Brazil yep. was coaching the linebackers. Yeah, so uh, so we coach we coach the year there in the AFL. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and didn't you have to like? Didn't you end up playing in a game for Pittsburgh yeah. or something? Like, <laughs> did the guy like did the league go on strike or something? Like something happened. Yes, and I and remember it because it was against Orlando, right? In Orlando. Yes, yes sir. I, man, let me tell you right now. Probably the weirdest football story ever. So we get down, we fly in hotel. The team goes to pregame meal. Uh, Derek Stingley, who was uh, the defensive coordinator and basically my defensive boss, he had, he had us drive around, just drive around. I said, are we looking for a club? We, where, where are we going, you know? And so instead of going to Anway Arena, whatever it was called, yeah. we ended up just driving around like it was Sunday. And then we ended up getting back. Uh, bless you. Thank we you. ended up getting back and realizing that both teams had basically been cut because that's the year that some guy, I forget his name, tried to start the AFL union. And um, Jerry Kurtz, the president of the AFL, got wind of it because the Orlando game was supposed to be, it was the national kickoff, you know. It was the first game of the season. So it was the ESPN's national game. So the players were going to basically kneel, like this Black Lives Matter. Yeah. They were kneel against the owner saying that we need more money, we need better housing. And so basically they got wind of it. And all, all I can remember is these burly state and police officers coming into the theater, coming to the arena, and basically escorting the players to get any, any player, the order was any player that did not sign uh, saying that you were not going to sign to be in the union, you were fired right at pregame meal. <laughs> yeah. uh, like, put that food back in the buffet yeah. area. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I was like, this is crazy. Instead of players getting taped and getting uh, treatment and stuff like that, players came in very hostile, gathering all their stuff with the police. And the sad part about it is that none of the coaches knew what was going on. This is the Orlando owner and the Pittsburgh owner all knew about it from Jerry Kurtz. Wow. It was crazy. So, so you had like a few hours and you're like, hey, we need, we need some guys. We got to play this game, right? This no, is no, 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 no. You're saying a few hours. In 90 minutes, uh, I remember John Secor, uh, real popular AFL player, Indiana, couple championships. He was the O-line coach. And so the coaches got together and in the arena, I was um, – probably to the west, the west doors, you could actually go out those doors and that's where the Orlando team was getting dressed. There was a plan. They had got scrub players that weekend on standby for any of the players who didn't uh, deny to uh, sign the contract or disclaimer of being, being in the union. So we had all these scared out players. They went out and saw this 20,000 capacity <laughs> arena and they a lot of them just left they were scared they were stage fright damn so me and so we were asked so Lynn Swan one of our owners and uh, childhood idol he comes in and he looks at me and John knowing our arena experience and goes guys we may need you to suit up tonight <laughs> <laughs> but I had not run a sprint in like two years you hear me how old were you roughly at that time let me see here. Um, that was 12, so 40, 42, yeah. 42 years old. Yeah. And I was still in good shape, yeah. but not arena shape, you know? Yeah. Not ready to play a game. In Come on, an Andrew. Hour. You know, man. Come <laughs> on, man. So the first thing I said was if I die, my wife would kill me if I didn't call her and let her know I'm about to play on national TV in this game. <laughs> So I call her, I'm in the stall, I'm getting ready. I'm like, give me a jersey, ball boy and the equipment guy are giving me stuff. And I go, honey, I got 10 seconds. 
I'm about to play in this nationally televised game. I love you. Tell the kids to watch it. And hung up. <laughs> and so this was supposed to be my AFL coaching debut. Right. So back, back home in Marion, our, our, our local watering hole was Ralphie's Family Eatery. So oh, I remember I was those Ralphie, coach, Ralphie tickets, right? Ralphie tickets. Remember that? <laughs> You've been in Mary, you know, I, hey, that's how I had to pay the food, man. So, but uh, we also had another local product. He's the quarterback. Um, he's the quarterback for the CFL right now. Uh, he used to play, he used to coach, he used to quarterback at Edinburgh. World popular guy, I forget his name. But he was actually, he was going to have his AFL debut that night. So all of like Central Florida was focusing on his nationally televised game. You got this owner, former Stiller. You got this local product done well. And so Ralphie's was packed. So I told my wife to tell the coaching staff back home and the players that your owner is going to be playing in the game as a starting Mac backer. <laughs> <laughs> and so they changed, they modified the rules, you know, as well as AFL, you know, the Mac and Blitz and things yeah. like that, you know. But they modified the rules because there, because there are so many new players. So the Mac could not blitz at all. And on, on um, there was no kickoffs. I think we started at the five-yard line. And on extra point and field goal, we couldn't rush the center gap. We couldn't try to block it. So they modified the rules to make sure that it didn't look like a gong show on TV. <laughs> I, didn't, I don't think I watched it, but I remember – because if I remember correctly, I was in Florida still because um, I had the Tarpons at the time. And I remember probably a couple of days before them trying to get some players on standby, like you said. So, right. and I mean, they had some guys like that actually played arena on standby, just like yourself, you know, a little older right. and not, you know, a lot older, <laughs> not, not ready to, <laughs> So how did your body recover at that age? I mean, did you put some licks on or what? Quite honestly, man, you know, I had about four or five tackles um, because I didn't have to blitz and I didn't get picked up in, in blitz protection. I actually felt great, man. We went out that night. We went out yeah. and celebrated. That was our only win of the season. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that whole season, it ended up, I think it ended up getting both coaches fired because – uh, our rosters were depleted, man. I mean, yeah. depleted. I mean, it's like you go. So you had all these dominating players on training camp. Training camp was Chris. Chris Sigfrey is a genius on offense. Derek Stanley is a genius on defense. We had good coaches and we had great players. But when you gut the team and there's only eight guys on, on the field at one time, it just made it really difficult for anybody to pull a rabbit out of their hat at that moment. So kind of going back, like, why did you, like, what kind of made you want to own, you know, a sports team? Like, what, like, what goes through your mind with that? I know my reasons, and I know my reasons today, um, but what, what were yours? You know what? I'm going to be honest with you. It all goes back to flag football. I'm not going to lie to you. And <clears throat> funny story, um, at Ohio State, your, your junior year or senior year, Ohio State has this, uh, the Ohio State, we have this rich tradition where if, when you get your class ring, they actually have a class ring ceremony on campus and the provost, and at that time, the president of the alumni association was uh, number 45, Archie Griffin. So during this time, I'll send you some pictures after the show, but my first child was um, in uterus. You know, my wife was pregnant with Kennedy. And I remember talking to him, a little bit of awe, a lot of respect. But I started to talk to him. I mean, he realized my background, whatever. And so I set up a meeting and I said, I really want to own a team. I really want to own a team because at that time I was dealing with the Marion Mayhem, uh, the team that was the first professional indoor team in Marion. And they had their highs and lows, but the flag football, to me, it kind of it kind of resembled arena football, eight on eight, and then flag football, semi-contact, smaller field. But when I talked to Archie Gr Mr. Griffin, I was like, I want to take a concept of indoor football. And I think with the marketing the, and uh, understanding how to recruit, 
I think I want to make money doing this because I've seen many businesses do that. I've seen you do it. I've seen you win championships. I've seen you take markets and go into big time arenas, but I've also looked at the Columbus destroyers, the San Jose Sabercats. And I said that with the right education, the right business model, and you know, people coming through the doors, I can probably make, make a go at this. Now, initially, I got approved. I was I went in with the owner and went into Columbus, Ohio, and we got awarded to play at the fairgrounds uh, near Nationwide Arena. And so long story short, uh, he came up insufficient funds. And so it became this battle of who was going to take over the fairgrounds. And so the fairgrounds won no part of it, and they kicked us both out. And I had I went scrambling for cover, Canton, you know, Cincinnati, and Marion, Ohio just seemed like the right place. Not the right market, but that's the reason why I got into it to recruit, build a front office, build teams. And it was kind of like my my grown adult joystick of running a ball club. So how was it from when you had this vision in your mind? to reality like so like how was it similar to what you were thinking and how was it a lot different because I know like when I got into it it's like you're in it and you're like holy I I wasn't anticipating this or that or so what was some of the differences for you Uh, a lot everything from A to Z everything from A to Z because it's it's different it's almost like being a parent you know it's nice when you your your wife get married and you guys can keep a backpack, passport ready to go. You can go to Putacana. You can go to where you want. But now you decide to have a responsibility. <laughs> and you are responsible from the time that child comes out. Actually, you're responsible while that child's in utero. <laughs> Going to the doctor appointments in Hunan Yard. So I'm translating that to building something from the ground up, from marketing, capital, where are you going to get the right coach that's going to actually follow the mission statement in the business plan? You know, you say that you have $100,000 to spend and the coach wants to spend one fifty. dollars you got to get him out of there, you know? So it was just different, man. And I feel as if that if you didn't have good mentoring, if you didn't have a good internship year with somebody, you can't, a lot of failure is a lot of, a lot of owners going to this business with pipe dreams, thinking that, I've seen Andrew Haynes do it, but they don't see all the muck and all the mess and all the meetings that a team has to go into. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult invent, in, endeavor. Yeah, no, it is. And, and I remember from the league side when I was league president, it's like, you know, everybody who comes in, you know, you, you talk to them and, well, we got this 10,000 seat arena. We're going to sell out because this is the big football community. No, this is really a big football. I, right. I've heard every community is the biggest football community out there. It's exactly. And then it's like, look, you're not going to sell out. It's, it's very hard. And, you know, new owners typically tend to focus on the field. They get caught up in, you know, I, I, I use the word jock sniffers a lot. Um, <laughs> that's good. You know, that's good. That's, that's where, you know, they get, they get all focused on that and they think winning puts butts in seats. And I will argue this any day at this level, winning does not sell tickets. Now winning can create more excitement. It can help, but winning this is like major league sports. If they're winning, you typically see that in the stands. They right. typically uh, do better minor league sports is not the case and it's frustrating when owners come in and and you know as a league as a league uh, president you know I take a lot of heat for the failures of teams which is frustrating and I can only tell people so much and and so it's good when you get somebody like yourself who you get both sides of it you you have to be competitive you have to put a good product on the field but you also have to do that in the front office and in the community. And you always did that. The one thing I liked is you never really put up with anything. So like you were, <laughs> you were not afraid to just fire a coach. Like 
<laughs> and like coach yourself or whatever. Like how many coaches have you fired? Let's see here. Um, <laughs> I wanted uh, let, with the mayhem, they wouldn't let me fire that coach. Uh, I didn't have all <laughs> as a GM. They, that was their guy, <clears throat> but who was the coach see, there? Um, Reggie Jones, uh, another semi-pro player. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you never will. Um, but as the, as the president of the Blue Racers, I don't think any coach has made it from training camp <laughs> to the end of the Signed season. five-year deals with coaches. They're gone in two months. <laughs> and let me tell you, let me tell you, and I mean, we've been, we've been friends for a long time. I remember when I first met you, you are uh, the owner of the, I think owner of the league and, but, and also owner of Canton, the Canton legends, I think, or Cougars. Canton Cougars. Oh, yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and so I just remember how you ingratiated me. You made me feel like I belong. Like, let me invite you. You know, it wasn't, oh, it wasn't over the top. It was just like two of the boys going out. And that made me feel like, man, you know, that's exactly how I want to make people feel when they come to my arena, you know. Like, you know, ever go to a nice restaurant and a waiter, every bite is just on top of you, man. Like, I was about to tell my wife some sweet nothing, but you are back at the table again. So I feel as if that, you know, getting into getting into this sport, man, you know, that the mentorship is just so important. I, I really do. I think the mentorship is very important. And um, I never want to, I never want an owner to ever, because there's people that are still out there that think that, you know, um, if I have a few bucks, that's what they have seed money. They don't have money. They have seed money. Shit, they don't even have seed money. Seed anymore. money. Yeah. <laughs> they don't even have that. They just, right. they, they got, you know, a hundred dollars to, <laughs> you know, get a, a, a little website going. They steal somebody else's logo and then right. they, it's frustrating how far it's dropped. It is. And I'm going to be honest with you, when you were working on other stuff, and I could see the fire. You're like, you know what? I'm going to work on some other things, you know? And I was like, Andrew, what? Like, you love football. You love this business. <laughs> but you, like you say, you understand inter entertainment value. Uh, and, and, you know, back to the coaches, like, the reason why those coaches, they fired themselves. They fired themselves. And for the league and the team's sake, I never wanted to ever bash a coach going out the door. I think that you show your professionalism by just saying that, hey, we just parted ways because now the league doesn't have to answer for Marion and I don't have to answer for Marion that much. And some of the reasons was that from uh, coaches brandishing weapons, um, you have coaches that come to town and they think that they're the next playboy. And not only do they want to acquire uh, the ladies in town, but they're going after the sponsors, uh, workers, and things like that, which is a strict violation of the code. Um, you have especially that, you're in a small market too. I mean, it's like people got to think. I right. Mean. So, so that's what happened. And so, when coaches for a few hundred dollars a game don't understand that this is an opportunity league, you've never coached anywhere. You probably will never coach after you leave the Blue Racers. A lot of coaches fire themselves. So. And I, can, I know it was probably like the running joke. Like, I wonder when LC is going to name himself coach again. You know? <laughs> how many times, how many times, separate times did you announce yourself as coach? Three to three to five at minimum. <laughs> minimum. Love it. Minimum, man. And, and quite honestly, man, when I started telling people, like, I would sit and talk to the mayor, Mayor Scherzer, who's a big supporter, the commissioners the fairground who had my back for everything, I will let them know immediately what's going to happen because, you know, these coaches, I can't babysit. These coaches will have keys to the Coliseum, keys yeah. to everything, you know. And so, I mean, me and the locksmith were like this, man. We're like, hey, you know. <laughs> like, damn, time for new locks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that guy expanded his business because of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um but yeah man it was a it was a good time it was a i learned a lot would i ever do it again uh it wouldn't be indoor football unless i just had 
hit the lottery. And I basically like some of these owners now, they're not, excuse me, they're not making money off of their, off the sport. Like Stephen Ross, you know, I'm down here with the Dolphins and, you know, he's a big real estate guru. You know, he makes his money with real estate. And yes, he owns Hard Rock. Yes, he owns, I mean, they're putting together a state-of-the-art uh, training camp facility because the Miami Dolphins have been, um, they've been playing and um, they've been practicing in, with their training camp uh, over in Davie, and that's done. And I'm sorry, I'm seeing how the building's being erected, but these guys, they don't have, they don't make their money solely on NFL. So like indoor guys, they're just wishing, they're, they're just hoping, they, they pray for a, a home date so they can make money but you got to make money with other things through your entertainment value. I'll tell you what, over the, I don't know, almost 20 years I've been in it, I've been able to kind of learn to use the team teams to fuel and push my other businesses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my marketing company that I've had for, for, you know, most of that time, I started it because I wanted to cut out the middleman when I was league president and had all these teams is like, why am I paying all these people that are middle people? And so I started hiring a designer, started hiring in house. Then I started offering those services to sponsors, to other people that I've met in the business, promoted my business as a sponsor. Sports marketing does work. Um, and I can, <laughs> I can show you the proof. Um, but that's where, you know, I got to, um, it's such a great game. If it was a break even or a profitable venture, I'd probably do it forever. Yes. It's, you know, so up and down and it's, it's difficult because there's only, you know, seven to 10 games. So it makes it very difficult to um, maximize. But the one thing I, I'll run this by you. the one, the one idea I had is what if you had a more of like a globe trotters, touring product where you know you're not it's not a league but you know you go to the market one time can you fill up Amway Center in Orlando can you you know can you fill up you know um, Hertz Arena in Fort Myers you know uh, where it's not a season where you don't have to worry about it. it's just a one-off event it's like the circus coming to town and you just have a you know you travel with the field you travel with the whole system set it up play entertainment well i mean to support that i think is a great idea because people for entertainment value when you look at branding they look at that event coming in town you know if beyonce play i don't care how big beyonce and jay-z are people don't want to see beyonce and jay-z every saturday oh. you know it's like oh it's coming in town just like when the circus comes to town you can't miss it because it's that weekend where yeah. you have a season. You're like, ah, I'm busy this weekend. We'll get, we'll get to a game. Right. We'll get to a game. Right. Absolutely. You limit your options. And on top of that too, the nice thing about the traveling team, like the Globetrotters is that if you have that star that used to play in the NBA, that used to play uh, the NFL or whatever, or Ronaldo, whatever, whatever sport it is, people are attracted to that because they've already bought into that brand. Yeah. And so when your brand is national or global and you're now the traveling circus or, or team, now you have people all over the country that want to see that Ronaldo or that, that special person. So I think it could work. The, the, we both know the downside to this business when it comes to minor league sports is that we're held hostage by our fellow co-owners that don't have any money. And when you're, co if, if Haynes, I've never, I knew that, any team that Andrew Haynes had was going to fill. A team in Erie was going to fill. Saginaw was going to fill. Dayton, uh, Cincinnati would fill. But you had so many owners, and we were so we were so uh, so few in between that we couldn't. We didn't know if the next team was going to show up even for a home game. So that's the sad part about it. But you get me. You get me the Tarpons. You get me Erie. You get me Saginaw. You get me some of these teams that's going to show up. Yeah, we can do it for 10 years. And then now work on TV, radio, branding, sponsorship, things like that as a, as a league. Yeah, it's always tough. And it, it, it's something that 
I feel partly responsible for the downturn of it because I let some owners in that really had no business in, but I was getting pressure from teams to add, add more teams, of course, fill in some gaps. So, so it's, it's definitely rough, but go, but let's go back to, um, we were, you and I were the first people to ever play like an out of league game. <laughs> and I remember it, uh, it really ruffled a lot of people, but um, how did we even like, how do we come up with that? I don't even remember. I mean, were we just BSing one day and As usual. talking trash, you As know, like, usual. oh, I beat your ass, you, you know, hey. and. Uh, <laughs> hey man, I think that it was 2013. I remember the year. And it was the worst year ever statistically, man. I mean, we basically couldn't win. We couldn't win a game against a high school team. And you and I, I knew there were some um, upcoming off weeks and stuff like that. And I knew that I was getting rid of half my squad. I mean, they oh, don't the don't camp. start making excuses because we beat you. Like. <laughs> no, 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 no. I still had a good squad, but you acquired my quarterback. You acquired you acquired so many guys. But the thing is, is that we, you and I, had always wanted to do business together. That was yeah. we respected each other's business model, and I one hundred percent wanted to play you. There's no doubt about it. I wanted to play you. I wanted to run up the score on you and then go take you out for a beer after <laughs> she said. And I know you want to do the same thing to me, but your model works. And I don't care if I signed the contract or not. Of course, teams, of course, teams have to protect their interests by not allowing their contracted teams to play outside of their of their league. But it was an off week. Uh, your team wasn't was your team was idle. My team was idle. You had the marketing. You had the, the great arena. You definitely had a couple of dollars. And it was time to do a, like, like you say, it was that one-off thing, you know, right. that Globetrotter effect. And the buzz on social media, it got to the point on Facebook at that time that Facebook asked me to basically either increase my bandwidth or something like that because we were just getting so many hits. <laughs> And that was probably, even though we lost in dramatic fashion, that was one of the most exciting times in the five years I was the owner of the Blue Ocean. Yeah, that was a fun. That was definitely a fun time. I couldn't even remember who won, so I had to look yeah, it up you won. last night. Yeah, you won. Did, it was close though. It was like fifty something to forty something. So yeah, I think was. I I think I told my guys to like you know, hey, take it easy on these guys. You know, we don't uh, want Lamonte firing somebody else. Oh, you talking about, oh, you're talking about the players <laughs> or the referees? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> well, the refs. It was a good it. time, Andrew. Referees time. don't like me, so right. <laughs> that I can guarantee you. Mm -hmm. No, that was good, and I remember. Then you know we kind of got the uh, the X League going, and we were able to join the leagues. And I know that uh, my last year in St. Louis, which was the probably the most uh, unfun season I had. Okay. At the game two, I knew I was done with arena football at that point. Why you say that? I just, I wasn't having fun. You know, you got to remember 2014 undefeated. We're killing it in attendance over 5,000 fans championship game, almost 8,000 against Lakeland. We, you know, our team got really, really cocky at the championship game. Like, just, you know, we were having like a, a, a banquet type dinner for um, both teams. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's, they're, my guys are acting like fools. I mean, they're, they're talking shit. They're like, just, just not the proper place. Right. And it started with our head coach, um, who you know as well, Chris McKinney. Of course. Love Chris. Great player, great passion. He just, he just has to hone it in a little bit. Um, Absolutely. So that year was a lot of fun because we were building up and that championship game probably was the best atmosphere that I've been a part of. It was from the morning you got to the arena, you could just feel it. And it was big in St. Louis. And anyway, we lose it the last uh, 37 seconds of the game. We fumble on the goal line to take the lead. Mm -hmm. The champagne was in their locker room. Now it's in ours. Now we have to take it back to the other <laughs> team. Um, but we finished the season. And it's like, okay, hey, it's, it's a down, down 
um, thing. I'm, I couldn't get over it that we lost. Anyway, you know, I have soccer as well. So I'm getting into soccer season. That helps. Then we're getting back into football. And then everyone from the players to the coach just had this sense of entitlement. And, you know, I don't, I'm like, I get stubborn in the sense, like if you tell if you dictate to me how it will be, it's not going to be that way. No, it's not. <laughs> and, I know that. And, you know, I'll spite myself just to prove you wrong. <laughs> um, and it just, a couple games in, I could just, I, I told Leah, I was like, yeah, this, this just is not fun. And she was probably like jumping up and down when I told her that, cause she's been telling me for years, just why are you in this? Why are you doing this? Um, but it came down. I remember the season well, and it's, it's funny how our two teams have a lot of, similar things happen. So my coach got fired after we lost to you and Marion. Right. And I think you fired your coach when we beat you in St. Louis. Immediately. <laughs> like didn't even get home. You fired him. He, that was the game. Statistically, especially what is about to go down to uh, Cape Fear. We had to, we knew it was going to be a tough game at your place. But at halftime, he is. He knows it's coming. He is basically giving the team the business. I'll let him do his thing, you know. I never want to cut the legs out of our coach in front of his players. You can't do that. But as soon as he came out of that locker room, I said, look, man, <clears throat> you beat this team or you're fired. Just Are like you, that. You've seriously said that to him at halftime? At halftime. I went down there with my director of security I was sitting with, and I said, you know what? Because, honestly – your coach was making so many in-game adjustments. It was so – a high school coach would have made these adjustments. We weren't using our weapons. Our pass blocking was, was crashed. You know, he couldn't even tell how to, how to slant the blocking because you had some studs on the D-line that was, that was coming around the corner. He didn't know how to slide the protection. And so I'm just like, you're in the middle of a, you're in the middle of a game. How do you basically, as an owner – Sitting up in the nosebleeds. Well, I was nosebleed. You always had good seats. <laughs> but how in the world can I tell the coach, who the head coach, how to make high school adjustments in a pro game, you know? And so I said, you know what? I had enough. And now, I, honestly, it wasn't just the football. Right. It was he was one of those coaches that wanted to uh, partake and extracurricular activities, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And it was hurting the brand, and he wasn't doing enough as the head coach to actually go out there and sponsor the team, you know. So you got this guy, that I'm, I'm paying to live here. You have a nice office. I pay you every meal. I pay your lodging, uh, gear, but you're not bringing anything in, and you're causing me headache. So we win that game, he stays on. You deal with it a little we bit, deal with right? It. <laughs> yeah. Winning solves a lot. You start right. losing, it's like, ah, you know what? Exactly. And you already know my background, as you said earlier in the show. I can do it myself, you know? <laughs> I can do it myself. So I'm shocked uh, you didn't I, jump in in the second half. Now, that would have been great, like a great story. You oh, just fired man. him at halftime, and you, you finished it out in one or something. <laughs> you know, man, I, I, I couldn't do it. Honestly, it's just like, to me, you almost, like you said, you almost have to take the punch in the mouth just so you don't seem to the public that you're an owner that can't sit in a seat. Yeah. So sometimes you got to like take the good with the bad. So did you physically tell him after that game or did you wait till you guys got back to Ohio? Did, oh, he, did no, you no. let him ride the bus back? Oh, of course, you know, because I feel as if that, <clears throat> you know, from a legal standpoint, um, as the owner of the Blue Racers, I'm still liable for him, you know? Yeah. So smart enough on the legal side to understand, you know, the liability part. So we got home, let everybody go home for the weekend, do their thing. And then we, uh, we were to resume Tuesday, you know, coming out to you is a pretty long trip. So I allow him, he was fired after the game in my head, but I allow him to go back to West Virginia and come back to Marion, Ohio at film time and tell him he's fired for good. He says, man, you could have told me this in St. Louis. I said, you know what? I'm telling you now. And yeah. I honestly, and it felt good, man. It really did. 
Yeah. It, you know what, when you make a decision that you know is better for your club and you and everything else, there is a sense of relief. I, when I fired our coach after we lost to you and Marion, it was more about, it wasn't about his coaching ability. It was more about just being in control, Mm -hmm. you know, of your actions because he was out there, you know, cussing out one of the players when all the fans were on the field for autographs. And there's a lot of kids out there. And uh, I, I grabbed him and said, Hey, dude, that this isn't the, the place for that. And he had some words for me. Uh-oh. And that point was like, like, Hey, you know, what? <laughs> it's done. Don't, you know, and then I try not to go back to my younger years where I'm a hothead too. So right. I'm just like, <laughs> right. But there has so to be that next- line, Andrew, there has to be that line when you or when you get a chance to deal one-on-one with the owner, the president, the person that out of all coaches, I mean, you and I, we could bring coaches in from East coast to West coast, you know? And when you feel as if that your stuff stinks to where it doesn't stink to where you can actually look at the owner and tell him how you feel without any repercussion, like you say, you got to go. All right. The, I signed the checks. I do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what are you thinking? <laughs> yeah. You got to go. I you waited know? till the next day. It was a Sunday. I remember in the office, call him in and you know, like I haven't spoke to him since, uh, not because I wouldn't just, it, it hasn't, uh, I'm sure he's not a Haynes fan, right? but I mean, I, I think he's, a, I think he's a damn good coach. Mm-hmm. Damn good coach was a great player. He played for me with the, the Tarpons too. So, um, you know, stuff like that happens, but how many, let's go over some people, some names yeah. and see, okay. So they played for you or coached for you and me. So who were they with first? Okay. okay so let's, uh, a Martino, Coach Martino. Martino Theus. Because um, he coached with... the Missouri Monsters for me, which was the St. Louis attack. Right. Was he, he with coached you for me? First? He coached for me. I don't know if you had any before then, but I know I brought Martino in from some indoor world and, uh, in 2013. We actually played up in Rochester for two years together. He was okay. a boss, monster offensive specialist, 1,800, yard, 1800 yards in a season, 40, 50, 60 touchdowns. He got that smooth voice, man. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. He needs to be like an R&B singer or something. Uh, Martino, he is, he is a phenomenal person and a, and a phenomenal athlete. While it didn't work in Marion, let's just say this. Um, Martino is a player's coach. Well, Martino doesn't know how to separate between a, being a player and a coach. That is a tough thing, too, a lot for these younger coaches coming in because, you know, like, like McKinney for me, this was like really his first or second coaching job. Mm-hmm. So he's so used to being in there with the players. It, it definitely takes time, and then you got to separate that. I mean, it's good to be uh, – um, a player's coach, but you got to be able to separate that. I think he was with you first because I brought him in in 2013. Yeah, because I let um, him go. I let I let the coaching staff I let the coaching staff go with players, and I think you picked with Claude. Yeah, I was gonna, yeah. I was another one. I was going to say D lineman. Um, there was a three guys I think in um, that. I just took your scraps. They were good players. No, give me they, wrong. They were. They, were they just player. had some other other stuff going on. It was off the field. Yeah, yeah. Off the field. It was hurt. I mean, they, you get guys who are 6'4", six, 6'5", six, come off the edge, can block. Martino can coach. They, they're, they were not with me because they didn't understand the football side. Was Tavares with you? Tavares was with me. Woodley. Okay, so Tavares played for me with the Tarpons when we went undefeated. He was with you first. Remember? Yeah. So with us, he played, well, even before that, he was in Canton the yes. year before. I brought him in mid season. And then we put him because he was down from Homestead or something. We brought him in with the the Tarpons, but we had Chris Wallace. So we turned Woodley yeah. into like hell, he was playing like, you know, Jack linebacker. He was playing like receiver. Like he was playing wherever we needed. Right. And he's an athlete. And I made man, a mistake, Andrew. 
on record. I want to say I made a mistake. We're up in Saginaw, and Tavares is doing a great job. It was the Chef Curry antics. Like, I'm old school, new school. I believe in protecting the game, you know. And it was a knee-jerk reaction. I cut him after the game. And it was our first game up in Saginaw. We ended up losing by, like, a, I think, a touchdown. But it was it – was, he was the reason why we were even in the game. And it cost us the rest of the season when I cut Tavares. It, I mean, wow. I, I, I did a horrible job in processing what, the, the situation. And that's why we couldn't win. We only won one game. It was the last game, the last game of the year. But he was our, he was our Tom Brady, man. And I did a horrible job with that. He, uh, he definitely, he's a likable guy. Um, but, you know, he's got that. He's got that South Florida swagger to him, right? You know, the gold grill. The yes, grill. yes. <laughs> that was that was still, you know, people think that. I understand that people think that everybody that looks the same is the same, but that was even culturally that was kind of new for me, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but I can get all past that. Like I said, it was uh, all those guys that ended up going uh, to the Midwest. Phenomenal. I mean, I did a great job with picking those guys up, but. I probably need to tighten the ship a little bit, you know, as the general manager on all things off the field. I just, what I did is my, the way I was a general manager, I just said, look, we're going to watch the waiver wire. Whenever Lamonte cuts somebody, we're going to grab him. <laughs> <laughs> we'll deal with the off the field. Problem. We're like the Dallas Cowboys. We'll just sign anybody. <laughs> <laughs> hey, those guys, when we, when we came out to your place and played, they, each one of those, um, each one of those those guys that were released, they made me feel the burn that game. They all had good games. Oh yeah, they all had good games. How about uh, Eric Evans? Eric, oh, Eric wide receiver. Wide receiver. Man. man, he was a stud. You had Eric first. Stud. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like go up and get anything. Quick. He's so quiet. Such a quiet guy. He's a quiet assassin, man. Yeah, you know. That's yeah, it. he was. He was really good. Cause where did he play? He played that first year in. Uh, Eastern Kentucky Drillers, I think. And yeah, for he was, Grants. Yeah, yeah. And he was one of the top receivers there. Yeah. And then um, I tried to get him down in uh, – maybe I did with the Tarpons. Um, I tried to get him down there. Mm -hmm. and was able to get him out with Missouri and St. Okay. Louis. So, But he was <clears> – <throat> he was a really good player. What was kind of the – um, craziest thing that you experienced in your days of owning a sports team? The show is not long enough. Um, <laughs> um, you know, off the field, probably the political significance in town. Uh, going to, here I'm a city boy, grew up in Pittsburgh. If you didn't go to, um, if you didn't go to like the farm shows, if you didn't go to the cookouts, um, if you didn't go to the popcorn festival in town, these were like the things to do in Marion, Ohio, which for, the, for our audience, Marion, Ohio is a agricultural environment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the poorest county out of all 88 counties um, in Ohio. And wow. so when you have a whole bunch of defunct and shut down uh, steel factories and things like that, you know, um, agricultural is still king. And so uh, as our name, the Marin County Coliseum, the Marin County Coliseum is where all things happen there. The voting booth is there, the pop, you know, a lot of the stuff that happened in town. So I realized that after the season, I couldn't just disappear. Even though the business was still going on, I had to make myself available 12 months out of the year to make sure that those people that want to sponsor and invest, they let me know, we didn't see you at X, Y, and Z. So maybe next year, and they held on to that sponsorship check so they saw the owner, his family, and players with their jerseys on. And so that's why I stayed on the phone with you to kind of like, for that mentorship, like, man, how are you doing it? And I can see you with your tablecloth, your backdrop, your wife, your family, <laughs> Everywhere. Everywhere. So I try to copy and paste a lot of the stuff you did. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think that's important at that level is just to be visible as an owner and every team says, Hey, we're going to be involved in the community. And it's easy to say, 
it's a lot of work to do. Yes. And um, I know in St. Louis, you know, we did probably 200 plus events a year between our staff and you have to have dedicated people. I mean, cause that's a lot, a lot of weekends and evenings, but it's also what produces, you know, um, great relationships and great relationships turn into building your business. So, um, it was, it's definitely, and it's fun. It's, I, I, for me, I like meeting people. So I'm never one of those like, Hey, I'm the owner. I'm not going out there. I'm, I'll be the first one to, uh, to volunteer. I want the other people to, to see that the other staff and they know, okay, well, if the owner, his kids, his wife are at yes. a lot of these events, um, it's probably good if I go too. Absolutely. I mean, people buy in and let's, let's face it, you know, in the minor leagues, when you're at these, you're at these functions and people don't, for those of you that don't understand, minor league sports is a 12 month business. So if you think 100%. That, if you think that after the season, you can uh, just go home or just go to Punta Cana, well, you're probably not going to be able to make it to the next league meetings because you don't have anything coming in. So, but more, what I was going to say is that it's probably way more important because when you're meeting the vice presidents and owners of these companies, they're more likely to do business with the owner than they are your director of sales. You know, mm -hmm. like you're getting it straight from the horse and, <clears throat> you know, you're, as the owner, you could say, hey, you want this suite? Well, I got you, you know, but I need X, Y, and Z. And you can close the deal right there over, over a rib sandwich. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. What's your most proud moment, you know, during your ownership time? Proud moment collectively has to be 100%. That wins, that money is when my front office and my players get that next deal, when they get that next contract, when they go to the Phillies, when they go to uh, the crew, when they go uh, with the Dolphins, when they get that next contract, man, nothing, our family celebrates because it just shows that the league works, the team works, and there's buy-in from everybody. So when you actually put that up on all social media and your website, breaking news, Brian Williams signs a deal with the Pittsburgh Power, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a circular type uh, revenue for his money and for his recruiting power because those players that may have wanted to play for you, they may want to think about playing for LC because he has a connection with this team or this team. Like this, I've seen a number of players that have come, that have come racing out of your organization signing deals. So that, that would be the, that would typify um, my highest event, my highest um, reward. Yeah. And that, I mean, you've had a lot, not just, I mean, you've had a ton, a ton of players, probably one of the most out of a team that I've seen. Um, and then, but front office too, mm -hmm. you've had guys. And, and I take a lot of pride in that as well Is you know, trying to develop and, and build people up, you know, whether that is front office, you know, players, you know, I mean, the one year in Florida, we had four guys sign mm -hmm. NFL teams in the same week. Exactly. Dude, I saw that. And you know what? The whole league is excited. The whole oh, that's huge for everybody. <laughs> it is. And then we go up and we play Lakeland and Mink with like 13 guys and beat his ass. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> But he got the best. He got the best one on me, though, winning that championship. I but know. that one, I was, we we were all surprised, man. We thought it was a walk in the park for you. Uh, Mink is a good coach. Yeah. But, um, yeah, man. I just really feel as if I, I'll tell you right now. I did the five years I owned the team. 2012. Even though we didn't win the championship that year, uh, we lost in like overtime in that outdoor game against Erie. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but we had so many moving parts. We had myself. Uh, coaching in the AFL and running the Blue Racers with players going up to the pit with Pittsburgh and uh, other places, IFL. 2012, the UIFL and us playing that arena-style arena style, uh, offense, that by far was the best year out of my five, even though that my first year in 2011 and 2014, we ended up going to championship uh, games and falling short. But 2012, I would copy and paste 2012 all day being in the UFL. That's cool. That was a, it was a fun year. Um, and competitive. Yeah, man, there were some good teams and we were, you know, Florida to, I don't know. Uh, Cincinnati. 
Yeah. Do we have anybody in New- nobody in New York at that point? No. Um, but no, that's that's fun. So, um, how often do you you know think about it? You know, the you- all the time. Yeah. All the time, man. You know, some I fun memories. Of, they are. They are. And I just like I said, you know, as, um, as my comment earlier, if I could take those number of owners and we can all sit in a room for a weekend, three days, and just basically brainstorm how we can do our own thing and be honest about the capital, be honest about the position. I don't, I don't, I don't have to be the owner. I don't have to be the VP. Honestly, when I started the team with my, with the, uh, with my fellow owner, fellow uh, partner, I wanted to be in charge of business operations, setting up the office. I said, you can take football ops all day. Because to me, that should be easy. It's the 12-month job of running the business is where I want to make sure that I have my hands on the, on the, on the checkbook. And I also want to be on top of the sponsors because he didn't have that gift. He didn't have that gift of going out and just being um, – he didn't have the gift of gab. And he also was rough around – he was rough around the edges like an like a old football coach, you know. So I said, you do that, and uh, I'll make sure that – we have because you know, get, being a sponsor, getting a sponsor, it's like the it's like project management. There's twelve steps of sponsorship and donorship, and when you get that check, you don't want to just say goodbye for six months. Right. You want to be able to invite him or her and the business. So it's that twelve months relationship because now before that next check, I can probably up the dim like, look, you know what? We know we got this player from the NFL. He would love to do the ribbon cutting at your place, X, Y, Z. You know what I'm saying? And so, yeah. like I said, I learned a lot of that stuff, man, you know, from you. And um, I would do it again with the right people, you know. Yeah, I think that's the key. I mean, I've always said, like, look, if you have, you know, you take all of us old timers now <laughs> um, and you just you put together a big group where nobody is doing this um, – as their livelihood, nobody is um, mm-hmm. gonna go broke if they lose twenty five, you know, thirty grand. Um, just have fun. It it could be a lot of fun uh, if if the right people are involved and the business models right. When you you were there for five years in a small market, it's so tough to make it in small markets. Like, what do you think was the biggest factor for your success there? Family family because um, the first year I started the team um, I was I was having Christopher my uh, my second child and um, it was driving me nuts on getting all of the things off the ground balancing her her nerves and excitement me trying to get back home to be the right daddy get back home and so without that family support I'd have had to worry about these new coaches players a new city and them Siobhan, she basically made sure that the house was good. And so I could focus on, because Marion, uh, for the viewers, the Columbus and Marion is about 50 to 50 minutes to an hour drive. So it's not right around the corner. Uh, straight shot, but not around the corner. So I couldn't worry about child pickup, going to her appointments and things like that, and devoting myself 90% of the time in this new city and, um, because I got one shot, you know. I don't look like the people in town. I don't sound like the people in town. And I had to do everything. I had to sell myself, you know. Did you buy cowboy myself. boots? Yeah. <laughs> no, I had a cowboy hat. <laughs> a pickup though, truck. You know? I couldn't do the boots. I couldn't do the boots, man, you know. And um, but yeah, you know, I, I bought a pig, you know, bought my fucking <laughs> no, <you didn't. laughs> I bought my because uh, you, I'm seriously? telling you, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because they have um what do they call um County fairs and stuff. Uh, it's a fair, but there's a there's a junior. Oh, FFA. Airport. Yes. FFA. And they ask you to sponsor. So getting with the commissioners of mayor, they're like, look, this is what you do. You better go buy yourself a pig or a hog. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and, I, and I did. But it taught me. It taught me. My mother and father grew up in an agricultural community. You know, they they um, they had to bale hay and milk the milk the cows and stuff like that. I never had to do it, you know, no calluses on his hand. But when you actually go into a city, whether it's Miami or Marin, Ohio, you better understand what the locals appreciate. If not, you'll never win them over. Yeah. 
Well, I'll say this. You and I both are um, very lucky with, uh, you know, our wives, you know, to have the support, you know, and uh, I mean, it's a lot of work that goes into this, you know, and there's a lot of uh, ups and downs, you know, in, in every capacity. And I know for me, that's one of, you know, without that, I don't know if I could handle it. You know, I've got one person that I can basically talk to, talk to her about anything. And that's, exactly. that's rare. Um, mm-hmm. So and we, she's we part definitely of the lucky. Like she's, she's a major part of the business. And think about our lives, Andrew. Like I have Siobhan, Kennedy, and Christopher. You have Leah, Natera, and AJ. So we both have, we both have wonderful wives with a, well, with a son and a daughter. And so that's what I'm trying to tell you, man. Like whether you realize it or not, I saw how you balance family and the business with the same family structure. You know, you didn't have five kids. I didn't have five kids. We had right. a wife and two, a boy and a girl. To me, that was it. Yeah. That's it. You know what this means. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. it. So. Uh-uh, no more. <laughs> Oh, we done. You know, so, the good thing I'm, is, hey, listen, I'm 41, mm-hmm. and AJ, who's my youngest, I mean, he's 16. That's cool. Natira's out on her own. She lives in Tampa. She's 23. Mm-hmm. So I kind of, starting young, I'm kind of, AJ will probably stick around for 10 years or something. But <laughs> Smart, <laughs> smart. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> no, no, that's that's big time. So, so what is, you know, what's your – you know, future look like? What are you, what are you going to get into? What do you, you know, I know you're working with the Marlins now a little bit and you know, what's kind of your plans or goals? Well, professionally, um, um, I definitely have, I've been part of sport entertainment, athletic administration for so long to where it's in my blood and the unique part of me being the event manager and, uh, um, account manager, uh, where I'm at, uh, just came up my one year anniversary at, at Marlins Park through Wes uh, and the Marlins. And the West security also has the contract for the Miami Dolphins. So, I mean, we're there for the Super Bowl, Super Bowl open night, uh, Jazz in the Garden, Beyonce, Jay-Z, Faith Hill. So we're, you know, there's a lot of events that are going on that we have to manage. And so, also, you know, with me acquiring state licenses for me uh, in the in the security world, there's a lot of work out there. So from managing uh, managing staff from the security and hospitality in um, with, with these big arenas, there's work everywhere. And I plan on staying in that for a long time. Uh, if another organization want, uh, wants to hire me to do something like to do something like that, I think I found a home here uh, in Miami. Uh, South Florida. So I think that that's where I'm going to focus, focus where I'm at now. As far as my family, uh, Kennedy, she's in eighth grade. Uh, she's a Duke tip kid, doing the well in school. Chris is nine. Kids finished. are growing up so fast, man. I, I see up. the pictures, man. I'm like, man. I remember when I had Christopher say like, you know, go attack. You go know, attack. That, like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 no. But, uh, you know, I just, I honestly, being a dedicated dad, being a responsible husband, being uh, true to my spirituality, I am a Christian. So, uh, and actually at nine thirty, I had to cut off my uh, my church service, man, because I was very excited about uh, uh, getting on this podcast. But, but that's where it's at right now, man. You know the and there's different. You know, offline we can talk more about some of the opportunities that this uh, security world has, has sent me to or leading me to. But it's robust and the security. Uh, industry is up quadruple since COVID nineteen, yeah. Black Lives Matter. So uh, it's, it's definitely um, it's definitely a field I want to stay in. Yeah, no, well, I definitely uh, we got to hook up. You know, I'm back in Florida. You know, I need that sunshine and palm trees. And if I took Michigan. this shirt off, this whole screen would go white. <laughs> like I need some color, man. I am, I am. Uh, <laughs> like Casper. So we got to link up, man. I'm so glad yeah. you're the reason you and Leah, I told you since 2012, you put that bug in me and Shaman's ear about coming down here. We did it. You had to leave. You obviously doing some good things and uh, with, uh, with that MLB team up there. So we're going to be glad to have you back. And when you do, man, you get settled. 
Uh, definitely want to come up to Orlando, buy you, buy you a watermelon. <laughs> I want a big steak. What are you talking about, steak. man? Yes. I, I see some of those steak places you go to. They rival where I go. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. watermelon's good, too. I'll take that. Right, right, right. <laughs> I'll take that. Uh, so, but no, man, I'm glad you're coming back home. Miss you down here. And um, that's an easy drive, man, up the coast. So I'm looking forward to it.